and do it elsewhere. Hey, there we are. Let's try that again. Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. Good to be with you this Sunday morning. Um, so I was wondering, I heard this week an interesting analysis, maybe you call it, of what you would call something. And do you know what you call a hen as it looks at a pile of lettuce? A hen as it looks at a, a pile of lettuce is called a chicken sees her salad. <laughs> chicken sees her salad. Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I thought it was better than that. All right, maybe. <laughs> Um, people accuse me of telling bad jokes. They don't even call them dad jokes anymore. They're just bad jokes. And I usually tell people I'm like Abraham Lincoln because I'm innocent. <laughs> and yes, that is the very same joke that Dwayne told last week. <laughs> I know you were here, Curtis. <laughs> Which means I can tell the same joke every week and you wouldn't laugh at it then either. Uh, but no. <laughs> Uh, they say that uh, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So I retell the joke that Dwayne told. Um, I could also retell the ones that Tate told because I appreciate so much that what you two gentlemen did last week. I think I've heard nothing but good things. I've heard affirmation coming from as far as Aunt Ruth in Nebraska sent a message and said that she appreciated what the two of you had to say. If it comes from Aunt Ruth... You know it's sincere, right? Take that to heart. Um, Aunt Ruth is probably watching now as well, so we appreciate you, Aunt Ruth. Um, and I'm not at all like upset that you know the sermon that you two preached last week has more views than my last two sermons on YouTube. I'm not even counting that. It's not about that. <laughs> Uh, but in all seriousness, I do appreciate it. It is really good just to hear from people in the congregation. I really like to hear your stories. I really like to hear how God is working through you, how you are taking your faith and applying it to your everyday life. You do not get to check your Christianity at the door when you clock in or when you go through those metal detectors at the courthouse, whatever it is. It's not like, you know, empty your keys, cell phone, faith at the door. You don't just leave it behind. <laughs> that goes with you, and I appreciate that. And if there's anybody else that wants to share their story sometime, please do not hesitate to let me know. But today we are talking about something slightly different. We are talking about table etiquette. And as I was writing out my sermon, I realized that I do not know how to spell the word etiquette. <laughs> my spell checker was angry at me this week. I finally figured it out after you write it about six or seven times. It has a T, etiquette. It's, I, I figured it out for at least a period of time as we decided that we were going to write about how we are to dine together. And of course, when we talk about table etiquette, what are some of the first things that come to your mind? What are the rules of dining together? Elbows off the table. I noticed real quick, there's some people here that are not doing just that. I also think of the forks. Does everybody know the fork rules? Like, how do you, work, you navigate that? That's so strange to me. Um, you, you got the dinner fork, you got the salad fork, you've got the dessert fork. And there's always that question, like, who is supposed to eat first? You're supposed to let the hostess or host have the first bite of the dessert before you take a bite. Uh, it's really important stuff. But I also don't think that's exactly what Jesus was getting at today, because in all honesty, they didn't have forks yet. <laughs> at least in, in the uh, region of the world where Jesus lived, forks had not been introduced or invented. I don't know when they invented forks. I'm getting off the topic. What Jesus seems to be more interested in is the seating charts and the guest lists of these parties. And I think what we're going to see today is a number of things about why these things matter. And I really don't think Jesus cares that much about the seating chart. And you know what a seating chart is, right? You've been to parties where there's seating charts. Uh, usually I think about like at a wedding. It's so awkward, isn't it? The seating chart, like imagine we go to like Second cousin's wedding. Like, I haven't seen this cousin in like five years, and they have already decided where I'm going to sit and with whom I'm going to be speaking for the next two hours, right? <laughs> like, we figured that Kevin would really enjoy having a conversation with cousin Fred because, like, I don't know. I, and I've got to sit with this guy for two hours. How awkward is that? Or even one of the first things that I remember from early on in my ministry, um, the first wedding that I ever did, 
I did a wedding, and you go to the reception. It was at a different location, and they had these seating charts made up. And this rehearsal, the reception was in this large banquet hall, and I don't know, it was before the children were even born. See, Sonia even remembers this. But they had Sonia and I sitting not in the banquet hall. We were in the hallway. <laughs> Like we're going through the table seatings and like a table, like the last, the second to the last table and it's out in the hall. And like, we, I, I just did my first wedding. I was feeling kind of important, right? <laughs> you think you get at least inside the building, but no, I'm out there sitting right next, not with the children's table, but right next to the children's table. And I kind of thought maybe someone would read this passage from today and say, hey, we can invite the pastor to move up, at least to be in the main part of the building. But alas, that did not happen. But that's okay. Because today we're going to see that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. We're going to see that this whole idea, these, these concepts of seating charts and guest list, this is really not about where you sit or who is invited to a party. This is about humility, and this is about spending time with people you normally wouldn't spend time with. Because I am very much convinced that some of us are going to be very surprised one day when we show up at the banquet table of the Lord, at the, the Lamb in the kingdom of God in heaven, and we look around and see the people who are with us. We are going to say, huh, I did not expect to see you here. So this is what we're going to focus on today. The seating charts and the guest lists of the kingdom of God and how we can apply that to our lives. So when I'm thinking about seating charts, the first thing that comes to my mind, you know, as I, I'm trying to think what would be the modern day equivalent of this, one of the first places that I always go to is the tables in a high school cafeteria. And I know some people have some really bad experiences from high school lunches. Anybody else or is it just me? Yes. <laughs> Not just me. Okay. Some others have had this experience as well. Um, but imagine like you go into any high school, even to this day, it hasn't changed in the 20 some years since I was in high school. And there's always these different tables. You have the table of all the cool kids where Tate Love sits. You have the table of all the jocks where Roger is sitting. <laughs> you have the table of the goths. I'm not going to name anybody. And you have the table of the nerds. And you have the table where I sat. <laughs> now, I imagine that if you were to be me, or whoever you are, and you got up and you decided one day, you know what, I really want to be with the jocks. I really want to sit with the cool kids, because the cool kids get all the attention, people like them. Um, you go and you decide, you know what, I'm just going to go, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to go sit with the jocks. So you get up from your table, you walk over with your tray, you sit down at the table of the jocks, and so far it's going pretty well. Nothing's, no, no problem. And then Bubba J comes up. And Bubba J is the linebacker, the starting linebacker for the football team. And of course, he dates the prom queen. And Bubba J walks up behind you and says, excuse me, that's my seat. Well, what are you going to do? You have to take your tray and you get up and you go back to the seat where you normally would sit. But of course, you go back to that seat where you normally would sit and your friends are there like, what are you doing? Like, what, now we're okay for you to sit with? So you can't even sit at your normal seat. You have to go down to the lowest seat. You maybe even have to sit by yourself. Because not only were you rejected by the cool kids and the jocks, your regular friends feel like they've been slighted, and now you're way down here at the bottom of the social totem pole. I think that's kind of what Jesus is warning against. He's like, if you start sitting at the very top of the totem pole, if you start sitting where you think that you want to be, you may be humbled in the process when Bubba J shows up and he wants his seat. But if you instead start by sitting at the worst seats, if you instead start by sitting at the kids' table, with, no, with all respect to the kids, <laughs> if you start by sitting at the kids' table or that seat right by the bathroom or the seat by the kitchen where the waiters keep going in and out, if you're at a, a party and you sit down there, the host may come up to you and say, hey, man, why are you sitting down here? You were the pastor at this. <laughs> you, were the, you, you married this couple. You should be sitting at least in the main building. They may move you up. 
And I see in this example that Jesus is not really trying to give us like these social tips on how to move up the hierarchy of social, of the social hierarchy. He's not trying to tell you how to get the best seats in the party. What he's trying to do is to remind us to be humble. Because if you walk into that cafeteria, you sit with the cool kids, and you, they're not quite comfortable with you there, you will be humbled. But if you sit with the lowly, you will be exalted in some way. He says this in verse 11. Holy cow, we jumped over all that. <laughs> Look at your notes, Kevin. He says this in verse 11. He says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now you think about how this is, like Jesus is flipping things upside down. Our normal social society, like how we interact with people, Jesus is turning it on its head. He's exposing the backwards way of our world. And I noticed this week as I'm reading through the scriptures, we're working through the gospel of Luke. I noticed that Luke does this a number of times. And there's some stories that are unique to Luke that fit this kind of motif. For instance, we have the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? There's this guy who's walking along, minding his own business, and he gets jumped. Somebody robs him, beats him, leaves him for dead. He's lying in the ditch. And somebody comes up along beside him and sees that he is hurting and he's suffering over there in the ditch. It's a clergyman, and clergymen are good people, right? You expect this clergyman to go and help but what's the clergyman do? He says, nah, you know, not my job. Pharisees come by, crosses the other side of the road, not for me. Finally, who comes along and helps this guy out? It's an outsider. Somebody that you don't expect. It is a Samaritan. There's only one gospel where you find the story of the good Samaritan. That is in the gospel of Luke. Luke also is the only place you find the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal son is the story about this guy, this younger son, who decides that he's going to go to his father and say, you know, I want my inheritance, even though you aren't dead yet. Totally normal. <laughs> I can't even imagine going to my dad and saying, I would like a couple acres of farmland. Thank you very much. Like, it, it, this doesn't happen. It's kind of weird. It's offensive. He does it anyways, and his dad grants him this gift. He goes off and he spends this money loosely. He blows it on stuff. And he comes back home. He's hungry. He's broken. He's detested. Um, he just wants to ask his dad, can he at least get a job? And the father says, you are my son. I'm going to throw a party for you. I will clothe you in a fine robe. Put a fine ring on your finger. Because if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Thank you, Beyonce. <laughs> Where was I? And it's the son that stayed home that is demoted. The son that left is raised to glory. And then we find in just the passage just before our text for today, in Luke chapter 13, this passage that I love to paraphrase every time we have a carrion meal, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So we see these inversions of what society expects throughout the gospel of Luke, especially in Luke flipping things on their head, flipping things upside down and backwards, or maybe they're flipping them right way. So Jesus talks about this social hierarchy at this party. He says, don't aim for the very top position. Go in there lowly like a servant, and you will one day be exalted. You already saw that one? So then verse 12 this is how Jesus follows this story up. He says, you know, this story, we need a little more nuance. So he gives another, or a little different version. He says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invent, invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. Don't you hate it when people repay you? <laughs> it's like, like, I don't quite see the problem there, Jesus, you know. But what he's saying is you don't invite your friends over for lunch, right? Don't invite your relatives. That means those of you that enjoy having your, your in-laws over so much, you know. Sorry, in-laws can't have you for lunch. Jesus says so. <laughs> no, I don't think that's what he's saying. Um, what he is saying essentially is um, he's rejecting this quid pro quo kind of society, 
He's saying don't just give something to someone else with the expectation that they will be giving back. Quid pro quo literally means that I'm going to give you something with, you, with the expectation that you're going to give me something in return. So, so AJ, I'm going to give you a, a candy bar with the expectation that you're going to mow my lawn later. Okay. He's like, okay. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, don't simply invite people over to your house because you expect to return, get something in return for that. If you invite people to your house for lunch just because they're going to then in turn invite you to lunch, that's not bad, but that's not the goal here. And we think about even in our society today, if we invite people over to our home for a party, we expect something in return. We expect, like, even if you can't invite me back to your house to have uh, lunch with you, maybe you're going to, I don't know, give me some stock tips or something like that. Or, or maybe you're going to fix the plumbing, the leaky faucet that I have at my house. Or, or maybe you give me free legal advice, Sarah Dell. What do you think? Well, that's beautiful, yes. You, you, but even like if, if I just invite you over because I think you're going to do something in return for me, that seems to be the problem that Jesus is speaking of here. So what he's saying is rather than inviting your friends, your coworkers, your friends, your in-laws, your, your relatives, what he says to do is instead invite the people that have no chance of returning that favor. Invite the poorest of the poor, people that can't have you into their home because they don't have a home. He says invite people who are differently abled, people that he names some, some, some challenges like blind people or people that are not able to physically move around, uh, crippled people, lame people, the outcasts, the people that society has deemed unworthy of hanging out with the rest of us. Jesus says, invite these people to your parties and you won't experience a blessing here on earth. They won't be able to return that favor to you. But one day at the resurrection of the righteous, you will be blessed. Now that almost sounds like works righteousness. And I don't think that what Jesus is saying here is if you feed the poor, you will be saved. You will go to heaven. He doesn't say that here. He says that in Matthew 25, but he doesn't say that here. That's supposed to be funny. Nobody laugh. <laughs> Sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. Um, but he does seem to say that there will be some sort of blessing for those who do feed the hungry, that invite the differently abled and the outcasts to your table. What Jesus is saying in this lesson is that we are called to be humble and we are called toward generosity. We are called to be humble and generous to people that much of society has written off and doesn't care about. People that can't return the favor, people that won't improve our social status, hanging out with tax collectors and sinners and, and disabled people and, and poor people doesn't make you look good to the rest of society. But Jesus says, do it anyway. These are the people you're called to love. All right, so as we were working, as I was working through some of these thoughts for today, the text for today, and reading through some commentaries, I came across a really interesting concept, a comment that is going to sound weird to you, but I think it works anyway, okay? As I was reading through a commentary, the Reverend Rob McCoy said this. He said, Jesus did not come to birth a church, but to birth a table. Now, first of all, that's a weird metaphor, isn't it? Like, birthing a table, you know, imagine. <laughs> Congratulations, it's a drop leaf. Like, what is that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, Jesus came to birth a table. It's a weird metaphor. It's mixing things up. It doesn't really make sense, but, you know, neither does really the idea of birthing a church. Um, but yet I think I like it. Because the more I thought about this idea of birthing a church, I realized that throughout the Bible, time and time again, we see Jesus doing this ministry, this, this reaching out and being humble and reaching to help people who are downtrodden and outcast. So often this takes place where? Around a table. And it's not just Jesus' ministry. It goes all the way back through the Old Testament as well. Many examples of tables and reaching out and loving people you normally wouldn't reach out and care for. Here's three examples. The first one comes from the 23rd Psalm. You know the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, there's this line in, chapter, in verse 5 of the 23rd Psalm that says, 
You prepare us the table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. That's the KGV, KGV, the Kevin Gosser version. So if I didn't quite nail it, that's <laughs> the KGV. Um, not to be confused with the KGB, but the KGV. Um, anyways, in that passage, you know, you prepare a table before me where? In the presence of my enemies. And I've said this to this congregation before. I don't think that what Jesus, or it's not Jesus, what the psalmist is talking about there is that he's preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemies so you can sit there and eat the finest food and they have to look at you and watch you eat it all and feel jealous. Like, ooh, look at me. God loves me. I got T-bone today. Um, no, these enemies are sitting at the table as well. This idea of being anointed with oil and your cup running over, that is an experience of joy and abundance. And the 23rd Psalm is saying, your enemies sit with you at that table and enjoy that abundance of God. That table isn't just an exclusive place for society's elite. The very people that you hate and despise are sitting at the Lord's table. The next one's a little bit weird. David's table in the palace. And this image comes from 2 Samuel chapter 9. I can just stop there, right? Everybody knows that one. Um, it's one of those stories that you kind of know because you've heard it before, but yet, like, nobody knows off the top of their head what 2 Samuel chapter 9 is. But this is the story of Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Yeah, I can't say it either. <laughs> Uh, Mephibosheth was the grandson of Saul, King Saul. So at the beginning of this chapter, David is the king over all of Israel. He's sitting there thinking to himself, and he's wondering, you know, how much of Saul's family is still left? Because Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in a battle many years ago. David's just sitting there thinking to himself, he's like, how can I bless somebody from Saul's family, one of his descendants? He asks the question, is there anybody still alive from Saul's family? And word gets back to him, Mephibosheth is still alive. So David draws, calls for Mephibosheth to come into his palace so he can talk to him a little bit. And then we begin to remember just who Mephibosheth was, the son of Saul. And if we remember, Saul tried to kill David multiple times. And Mephibosheth was injured during the battle where Saul and Jonathan died. He was hurt and was not able to walk ever again. But word got back to David that Mephibosheth was still alive. And this guy, the son, the grandson, the descendant of this guy who tried to kill David multiple times, he said, I'm going to restore your, father, your grandfather's land to you. I'm going to give you this parcel of land. And not only that, I'm going to give you these servants to work that land. And not only am I going to give you that, I'm also going to allow you to come sit at my table like one of my sons. And it's really easy to skip over that story because it shows so short and to the point. You miss the idea that the guy that, that David is inviting to sit at his table like one of his own sons is the grandson of the guy who used to try to kill him on multiple occasions. Zacchaeus, we know the idea of Zacchaeus. Uh, I talked about it with these, the children up here earlier. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but he was also a crook. <laughs> Notice who Jesus sat with and ate. He sat with this tax collector, Zacchaeus, and, and he dined with him at his house. Again, it's a weird thing because Jesus invites himself over, but you know, I guess that's Christ-like, so maybe I should do more of that. But he also, he's always sitting with these tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the people that are looked down upon by the rest of society. And when Jesus sits with these people, it doesn't look good for him. It doesn't help his reputation. People start to assume that Jesus, too, is participating in these questionable acts. He is accused of being a drunkard and a uh, glutton. And people will tell me today, you know, we, well, I'll save that for later. No, still. Anyway, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> Um, I'm going to jump around. Yeah, jump around, jump, jump, no. I don't need help going off topic. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit here about the Lord's Supper shortly. And uh, we talked about, in a, in a group recently, about you know, who was invited to the table. And someone said, you know, if we start inviting everybody to the table, 
then people are going to start looking at us differently. They're going to think poorly of us. Like they're going to assume that, that we are accepting of these people and accepting of their practices and accepting of their ways. And I said to this person, you know what? We're in good company if we do. Because that's exactly how people looked at Jesus. He sat with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, and people thought less of him. But we're still called to sit with them. Sitting with somebody doesn't mean you condone their activity. It means you love them and care about them. Which brings me to this last example, which when I think about tables is actually the first one that I think about. And I decided to do it last because the first shall be last. You see the theme? Flipping it upside down. It's the story of the Last Supper. I can think of the people that attended that Last Supper, and I can find issues with at least half of them. We start thinking about who was at that Last Supper, and I don't know who, which person is here, but we think about the people that sat at that Last Supper. We know that Jesus invited a tax collector, and a tax collector would have worked for the Roman government. The Roman government was in the business of exploiting the people, so he was, in many ways, working for the enemy. At that table, we also have a zealot, Simon the Zealot, who was absolutely against the Roman army or Roman government and was willing to go to battle to violently overthrow the Romans. We also have that table, we have um, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who are would-be um, genocidal, like they want to call down fire from heaven and destroy the Samaritans at one point. Jesus has them sitting at his table. We have people like, um, uh, we have people like uh, Thomas, who would doubt that Jesus even rose from the grave later on. And I'm missing one really big one. Who else was there? Judas, the one who moments from this time this picture was taken, <laughs> it's not a picture, would turn Jesus over to be beaten and crucified. These are the people that Jesus invited to his table that dined with him. So we think about the way Jesus talks about this, this guest list and the seating charts for this, this banquet that he is throwing. And we're so worried in our society about sitting at the table with the cool kids, sitting at the table with the jocks, about our social status. But we see that in the kingdom of God, this is flipped upside down. And if Jesus is willing to sit with the person who's about to turn him over to betray him, who can we invite to our table as well? So as I was sitting with this group of friends this week and we were talking about inviting people to the table, to the communion table, we talked about how it's often been the practice in the Mennonite church to have the, the bishop go around from church to church um, when it was time for communion and would say, who is permitted and who is not permitted to take communion? And I simply say, I don't see that in the text. If we look at the text the way Jesus did it, he had an open invitation. Anybody that wants to come to his table was permitted to do so. I believe there are times when we self-select. We can make the decision not to participate in communion. But that's our decision, not some bishop, not some hierarchy, hierarchical leader. That is our choice. Jesus' invitation is for all to come to him. And when Jesus uses this example of how we're supposed to invite certain people to our table, to our parties, People that can never return the favor. I think that is a perfect metaphor for the grace that Jesus has for us. Just as Jesus has extended his grace to us, we can never return that favor. The best we can do is receive it. The table that Jesus set here for that first communion wasn't a table filled with saints, it was a table full of sinners. They didn't get invited to that party because of something they had done. They were invited to that party because of who Jesus was. So what I want to do right now is I want to invite Sandy to come forward. And she's going to be playing through some music for us. And we're almost out of these little, little things. And you know I'm not going to throw anything away. Actually, I did throw a couple away because they were looking a little off color. <laughs> Um, so if you feel sick later today, please know that there's something going around. It's not because I gave you bad juice. I'm going to stop this recording right now. 